Hello everyone, happy No Ruse, and thank you for joining us at the National Council of Resistance of Iran, U.S. Representative Office. My name is Ayreza Jafarzadeh, and I'm the Deputy Director of the NCRI uh, Washington Office. We're delighted to host this event coinciding with the Iranian New Year, No Ruse. That's why, next to me, uh, we have a traditional half-seen table which symbolizes life, rebirth, health, strength, and sunrise. And that's what we are looking for, the sunrise of freedom in the new Iranian year. Let's hope for it, and let's work to make that happen. Now, before I uh, get to our speakers, let me remind everyone that our conference is broadcast live on our website, ncriaus.org and on all our social media platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Today, we intend to discuss the state of the Iranian regime, its weaknesses and vulnerabilities, the state of protests and the desire of the Iranian people for change. We will look at the behavior of the Iran regime to include its nuclear weapons program, its missile and UAV program, its support for proxy terror groups, its role in uh, supporting the invasion of Ukraine by siding with the unjust war there. And finally, what the US policy should be in countering all of these problems, but also in helping the people of Iran to achieve freedom the same way that the people of Ukraine are fighting for their freedom from occupation, invasion, and bombings. Needless to say that the US Congress has played a significant role so far and Key Democratic and Republican voices are pushing for a firm and decisive policy regarding Iran, and we're grateful for all of them. We've seen Senator Bob Menendez and Senator Ben Cardin, Senator Jim Reich and Ted Cruz, and many others um, expressing serious concerns from both sides of the aisle about US policy on Iran. Equally, there are bipartisan voices on the House side. To address all of that, we have impressive and distinguished guest speakers today that I will briefly introduce them on alphabetical order. And they are Ambassador Lincoln Bloomfield Jr., former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, Dr. Stephen Bucci, visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Ambassador Joseph D. Trani, former Special Advisor to the Director of National Intelligence, Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs. Ambassador Bob Joseph, former Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Honorable Michael Mukasey, the 81st Attorney General of the United States. Dr. Behzad Raoufi, Chief Validation Engineer for Space Missions. Ambassador Mitchell Reese, former Director of State Department Policy Planning. Mr. Jonathan Rui, JINSA Director of Foreign Policy. Ms. Suna Samsami, U.S. Representative of the National Council of Resistance of Iran. Honorable David Shedd, former actor, Acting Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Dr. Siamak Shojai, Professor of Business at William Patterson University. We'll have uh, Senator Bob Torricelli, former Democratic Senator from New Jersey, and General Chuck Wald, former Deputy Commander of the United States uh, European Command. And I have the uh, honor of uh, moderating the conference today. Also want to thank the very large participation of Iranian Americans from all over the United States, from nearly 45 states who are joining us on Zoom. You can see them now. Thank you all very much for taking the time and participating in this very important and timely uh, conference. Now, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Ms. Suna Samsami, who is the um, US representative of the National Council of Resistance of Iran. Ms. Samsami, please.
Thank you, Alireza. Greetings to all of you. Happy Nowruz, distinguished guests, dear friends. As we celebrate the advent of uh, Iranian New Year Nowruz, our hearts and thoughts are with the suffering people of Iran and war-torn nation of Ukraine. We cannot but laud the people, especially women, of both countries for putting up a heroic resistance, the former against the ruling religious tyranny and the latter against an occupying force. Although we are saddened by the passing of our beloved companion and vanguard, Dr. Manucher Hezarkhani, but once again, we greet Nowruz as a sign of end of all sorrows and pains. Let us also express the hope that with the start of the 15th century on the Persian calendar, a century of monarchic dictatorship and religious tyranny comes to end and freedom and democracy flourish in Iran. The Iranian regime has never been so weak in its 43 year rule as it is today. The economy is bankrupted. Inflation is officially put at 41% and 70% of Iranians live below the poverty line. The institutionalized corruption that spreads from the Supreme Leader to the IRGC and has engulfed the entire regime has left the Iranian economy run like mafia gangs, leaving no prospects of economic improvement under the current regime. Nevertheless, such economic malice, ineptitude, corruption, and mismanagement have failed to erode the spirit of resistance among Iranians. Khamenei decided to install Ibrahim Raisi, a mass murderer, as president to consolidate his regime and prevent the eruption of more uprisings. Raisi is hated by the overwhelming majority of Iranian people for his direct role in the execution of political prisoners, especially during the 1988 massacre of 30,000 political prisoners, the majority of whom belong to the Mujahideen Khalq MEK. And Raisi has relied heavily on the IRGC for his cabinet, for his foreign policy teams, and for the empowerment of terror proxies abroad. Nevertheless, Raisi has failed. Last year, Iran was the scene of major anti-regime uprisings every four months by former workers, teachers, nurses, defrauded investors, steel workers, and fuel porters. This was coupled with the expanding activities of the resistance units, a nationwide network of mostly young activists affiliated with the MEK. The regime's inability and unwillingness to resolve any of the underlying economic, political, and social problems plaguing Iranian society on one hand and its failure to extinguish the flames of resistance, the expansion of popular protest and the activities of resistance units nationwide on the other, lead to only one conclusion. Iranian society is like a powder keg ready to erupt at any moment with the slightest spark. Regardless of the outcome of the Vienna talks in 2022, and regardless of the scope and extent of any sanctioned relief, the mullahs will never stop their bomb-making program, nor will they abandon their terrorism or the production and launching of ballistic missiles and UAVs against the countries in the region. Indeed, on March 10, Khamenei insisted that he will not abandon the nuclear program even after the sanctions are lifted. The mullahs want a nuclear deal only to secure the funds to pay for repression and warmongering while they complete their nuclear bomb making program. The regime's entire nuclear weapons program must be dismantled, period. 
There is no half-faced solution for the Iranian regime threats. Instead of thinking which designation should be removed from the terror machines of the Iranian regime, including the IRGC and the Quds Force, the US and Western nations should look for ways to hold the regime accountable for the ongoing and decades of repression, genocide, and terrorism. The regime leaders must face justice for four decades of crime against humanity and genocide. This regime is a threat to the world, and the IRGC is a tool to keep the theocracy in power. Any sanctions relief would benefit the IRGC. Every dollar in the hand of the IRGC would further prolong the rule of the Ayatollahs and enables the regime for more repression at home and terrorism and mayhem abroad. Instead, the international community should recognize the Iranian people's struggle to overthrow the clerical regime and establish a democratic, secular, non-nuclear republic Iran. Nothing can stand in the way of victory by the Iranian people who have demonstrated incredible courage resilience and resolve in the face of adversities. Freedom will come to Iran. Thank you very much and happy Nowruz again. Thank you, Mr. Jeffers. Thank you so much, um, uh, Bissam Sami. Uh, indeed, as uh, you concluded, freedom will come to Iran. We're now going to uh, Judge Michael Mukasey, the 81st Attorney General of the United States. Uh, Mr. Mukasey, you've been fighting terrorism a good portion of your professional career. Now there are reports that the US government is considering to comply with the uh, Iranian regime's demands to um, lift the um, uh, IRGC from the um, FTO list uh, in exchange for their promise to ease uh, tensions in the region. So I appreciate when you make your remarks if you are able to also address this issue. Um, Attorney General Mukasey, please. Well, thank you, Ali Reza. Uh, thanks to all of those who are involved in this very important discussion, both those who are participating in it um, and those who are watching uh, to see if we can find reason for hope uh, for the sunrise uh, that Ali Reza mentioned in his introductory remarks. Even as we're meeting here uh, to discuss these matters, um, the, the dangers that the, th the regime in Tehran poses to the world and the way of overcoming those dangers. There are negotiators in Vienna that are having a, who are having a discussion of a very different kind. According to news reports, they are considering a demand by the regime that the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, uh, the IRGC, be removed from the list of foreign terrorist organizations that maintained by the United States. And that's supposed to be part of the price for Iran entering into a resurrected version of the JCPOA, uh, an agreement that is supposed to keep Iran at least temporarily from completing the steps toward developing a nuclear weapon. And that price uh, is said to include also a lifting of sanctions on the regime. It's hard to know where to begin in breaking down what's wrong with this picture. So let's take it one step at a time. As to whether the JCPOA can or should be revived at all, I offer simply the plain and documented fact that despite the regime's claims that it seeks only a peaceful use for nuclear technology, development of a nuclear weapon has been the goal of Iran's program from the outset. Documentary evidence proving that was obtained in 2018 when Israel seized and shared with the world documents from an archive in Tehran that described Iran's nuclear weapons program in detail. And those documents show that Iran has been working on that program nonstop since 1979. And when I say nonstop, I mean even during the time when the JCPOA was supposedly in force. And Iran, even under the New Deal being discussed so far as we know, would remain as one of the four countries designated by the United States as a state sponsor of terrorism, along with North Korea, Cuba, and Syria. Now, there are two entities that Iran uses to conduct its terrorist activities. One is Hezbollah, the other is the IRGC. In fact, the IRGC has taken credit 
for a missile that hit a facility in Iraq just a few days ago and has been shown to have distributed explosive devices that were used to kill American soldiers in, in Iraq and elsewhere. And this is the entity that Iran is asking to be removed from the list of foreign terrorist organizations as part of the price of entering, entering into an agreement that it is certain to cheat on, just as it did in the earlier version of the agreement. I submit to you that re removing the IRGC from the list of foreign terrorist organizations would actually be even worse than not having placed the organization on the list in the first place. As a practical matter, being on the list exposes people and entities that deal with the IRGC to financial and even criminal penalties under US law. But since it's been difficult for the United States to actually lay hands on anyone who is dealing with the IRGC, that may not be much of an obstacle. But being on the list does make some entities and some people reluctant to deal openly with the IRGC. But think of the effect of taking the IRGC off the list. That would in effect be the United States saying that the IRGC, which is one of the two entities responsible for Iran's status, status as a state sponsor of terrorism, that the IRGC is not itself a terrorist organization. The IRGC in essence will have been given the good housekeeping seal of approval by the US government such that no person or entity need have the slightest hesitation in providing resources or financing to the IRGC, banking services, or material to use in constructing weapons, because the United States government is certifying that it is not, or at least that it is no longer, a foreign terrorist organization. And of course, this deal is being negotiated for the United States, um, not by the United States representative directly, because uh, the Iran's negotiators in Vienna have refused to meet directly with United States negotiators. It's being negotiated by the regime of Vladimir Putin, who the president has already said is himself a war criminal. And further, Iran has asked that the United States guarantee that this new agreement cannot be renounced by any subsequent administration, which the United States can't do because the agreement will not be a treaty. The treaty must be approved by a two thirds vote of the United States Senate. And the administration is not gonna put this agreement to such a vote because it knows that it doesn't have the votes to support it. So it has offered, that is the, the, uh, the administration has offered what it calls inherent guarantees that the agreement will be permanent, which apparently means that Iran will be given the right to do, to go ahead with its nuclear weapons program with no restriction at all if sanctions are reimposed or any other advantage that Iran gains under this agreement is withdrawn by a later administration. Now, Nowruz is supposed to be, I recognize, a joyous time, but this year it's fraught with danger. If the mullahs are not to be given a runway to a nuclear weapon, whether through violation of an agreement like the one it has already violated, or even through compliance with the brief period that restrictions will be in effect, if that result is to be avoided, it will take bold action by the United States Congress, and in particular by the United States Senate, to assert its authority to review the agreement as a treaty and to vote it down. All we can do at this point is to wait and see what agreement comes out of Vienna, if any, and whether the hope that we all have for Nauru's, the hope of the sunrise that Ali Reza alluded to, that there will be no further empowerment of the mullahs, that the terrorist label on the IRGC will remain in place, that those hopes are realized. I pray with all my heart that they are, and that Nauru's brings us and the world to a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judge, um, uh, for your informative remarks, but also for your wish to see uh, a free Iran, uh, the, the sunrise of freedom in Iran. That's very much appreciated. You um, uh, also mentioned the role of Congress um, just today and yesterday. There were many reports that um, Senator Bob Menendez, Senator Cardin, and many other Democrats, along with um, Republican senators and others on the House as well, um, they're saying they need to have their own say. They need to know what's in any kind of agreement, and they will put forward the legislations uh, for approval, uh, and, and they need to be part of it. Um, with that, um, let me now go to 
um, Mr. David Shett, former um, acting director of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, and before that he was actually actually served for four years as the deputy director of the DIA. Uh, Mr. Shedd is uh, now a visiting uh, fellow in the Davis Institute for National Security and uh, Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Shedd, please. Thank you very much, Ali Reza, and Ms. Sazami, uh, a happy uh, new ruse to you. But let me build on Judge McCasey's comments about the IRGC in particular, and I will leave to the other distinguished colleagues to go deeper into the JCPOA 2.0 that's being negotiated in Vienna with the appearances anyway of coming to a conclusion uh, fairly quickly. As an intelligence professional, I always looked, as Judge McCasey would say, at the facts. And the unemotional perspective of thinking of delisting an organization that for 40 years has been the vanguard of the revolution is unfathomable to me, based on the facts that speak for themselves. As the vanguard of the revolution, the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps has been at the center of a strategy, both at a strategic level, but also at a tactical level of using terrorism as an instrument of national power. And to believe that being soft on them and somehow obtaining an agreement to delist them in exchange for them to behave otherwise is to say the equivalent of having someone change their DNA. Their DNA is terrorism as an instrument of national power against the Iranian people inside Iran and externally in its near abroad and around the globe. Terrorism is a central pillar of the Iranian regime. It has been and will continue to be because it is philosophically completely committed to the use of terrorism in order to stay in power and to promote the Shia uh, revolutionary uh, aspects of, of the regime. Well, when I think of the U.S. policy of delisting them, I also go back to not only the hundreds of American lives that have been lost or maimed in the war in Iraq, uh, Kobar Towers, and I could go on in terms of Syria, and elsewhere where the IRGC has actively engaged in terrorist acts against the American people as well, very specifically killing our men and women in uniform. But I think even more broadly, what kind of message does this send to other nations that might use as, a, as, as an instrument of national power, the, the role or the aspects of terrorism as, as a means for either staying in power or promoting their interests abroad? What message does it send say by delisting from the foreign terrorist organization, as Judge McCasey pointed out, that individuals or organizations associated with the IRGC, while potentially flawed in its implementation and fully executing US policy on, on the sanctions against those individuals or, or uh, organizations, what message does it send to those who think they can get away with terrorist acts and then simply be written off from an agreement that is non-enforceable at its very core when it comes to the JCPOA. Finally, how is it possible to even contemplate another round of an enormous amount of financial support to the Iranian regime that will very quickly go into the vanguard of the revolution, which is the IRGC and the Quds Force. So again, with my background as an intelligence officer, facts driven and looking at the perspective of a regime that does not understand anything other than strength and force 
on the other side of the table, why would they commit to softening their line in the use of the IRGC? And so for that very reason, I believe any contemplation of delisting the IRGC and the Quds Force and the individuals or the end or the organizations associated with them as a terrorist organization is unthinkable, bad policy, and ultimately will hurt not only the United States and its global interests, and, and, but violate the very values that we have supported for the last 40 years when it comes to countering the Iranian regime that we know uh, so well to be uh, instantiated in, in Tehran today, yet at the same time with the courage and the uh, forthrightness of that opposition that speaks up on a daily basis against this uh, uh, regime in Tehran, we need to stand with the Iranian people in not delisting the IRGC and not acceding to a demand that is done through a third party, that is the Russians and the Chinese and other members of this negotiating team that have been in Vienna while we sat outside in the ante room waiting to see what comes out of there. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I wish it were a more glowing uh, perspective for 2022, but hope springs eternal and we stand with the Iranian people in speaking up against foolish and bad, uh, bad policy and ill-conceived policies that ultimately will damage not only Iran, but the United States and those who stand for freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mr. Shed, for sharing your experience uh, with us. Um, you mentioned uh, standing with the people of Iran, and um, that's extremely important. Uh, as you know, the Iranian people um, made a revolution that was meant to be for freedom and democracy, but the mullahs stole that revolution. And they did exactly the opposite of what the people actually wanted. They named the top um, agency or institution for terrorism and killing the IRGC. They, were, they used the word revolutionary in that. They changed the meaning of um, everything. And um, thank you for reminding everyone that this regime only understands the language of force and strength. Um, with that, um, let's go to our next speaker, uh, Ambassador Joseph uh, Ditrani. Mr. Ditrani has served as the um, president of the um, Intelligence and National Security Alliance, a professional think tank. From uh, 2003 to 2006, Ambassador Ditrani was the special envoy for the six-party talks with North Korea in 2010. Ambassador Ditrani was appointed director of National Counter Proliferation Center and special advisor to the director of national intelligence. Ambassador Ditrani, great to have you with us. Please. Thank you, Ali Riza. It's, uh, it's an honor being here and, uh, and, and congratulations for uh, No Ruse uh, and uh, having this uh, distinguished forum to talk about this very, very important issue. Uh, my comments today uh, will be uh, bifurcated. I'd like to talk very briefly about the geopolitical aspects to, the, uh, to Iran's behavior and then get into the JCPOA and, and uh, what Iran has been doing with their nuclear weapons program. Uh, and uh, further to uh, Director Shedd and, and uh, Judge Lucchese, I, I think their comments were just uh, outstanding. Let me just add this on the geopolitical side. Over the years, we've seen Iran's behavior. We've seen what they've done with Hezbollah in Lebanon. We've seen what they've been doing with the Houthis in Yemen. We see very clearly, and our distinguished colleagues have just spoken about the IRGC and the Quds forces and their activities in Iraq, in Syria. I mean, it's blatant, it's out there. And this, preceded the JCPOA and subsequent to the JCPOA in 2015. I think we should remember this. When we were talking about the JCPOA and, 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 and talking about implementing it, there was a hope, some sense that with this, Iran will moder moderate its behavior. It will cease its terrorist activities, uh, its, its intrusive 
threatening behavior, whether it be in, in Yemen, whether it be in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, et cetera. But this has not happened. Subsequent to the JCPOA in 2015, it continued, not only did it continue, it intensified. So I think we have to be realistic and on the geopolitical side of the equation. Uh, Iran is on a path and all indications are they will not change what they're doing with their Quds Force, they're not changed with the IRGC, and they will not change what they're doing with their, if you will, their proxies. So I totally agree with my, uh, my colleagues when they talk about taking the IRGC off the uh, list of, uh, of uh, foreign terrorist organizations. I mean, what a message that would be. It would be profound. Let me, let me move to the nuclear side of the ledger because that's such an important side. Because we could see uh, in the Middle East, certainly we're seeing some of this in East Asia with North Korea. We could see in the Middle East, if Iran persists with their programs, let, let's be very candid about it. Up until 2003, we, we have definitive proof that Iran was pursuing a nuclear weapons program. And Judge Lucchese talked very clearly about what the Israelis discovered in, in 2018 to show that this not, not only goes back, it goes back to the 1970s. But certainly up until 2003, they were pursuing a nuclear weapons program with, with great vigor. Uh, and then with the, uh, and then prior to the JCPOA in 2015, Iran was enriching uranium to the 20% purity level. And what does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? That means that they, if they can reach to the 20% purity level, uh, it would not take that much time to move to 90, 93%, which is, which is weapons grade enriched uranium. And this is what we were seeing prior to it. So with the JCPOA, there was a sense there that uh, Iran would then cease and desist, come down to three point, uh, approximately 3.2, 3.6% purity of enrichment. But up until that time, we saw problems with the IAEA getting uh, their monitors to visit facilities in Iran. We saw that prior to the JCPOA. We certainly saw it subsequent to the JCPOA. The US withdrew in 2018. Uh, from the JCPOA, but that didn't change anything on Iran. In fact, intensified its efforts to enrich uranium to a higher level, enrichment up to 60%. Problems with the IAEA getting inspection, inspectors, monitors into facilities, building advanced centrifuges that would, uh, that would take it uh, uh, fewer hours, fewer days, fewer months, to enrich to a, to a level of uh, purity that would permit a nuclear weapons program. Iran is at a threshold as a nuclear weapons state as we speak now. And the logic here is now coming back to the JCPOA, uh, Iran will uh, cease and desist. It would move in the, a different direction. Well, we know from the JCPOA that there are sunset clauses, sunset clauses for centrifuges building more sophisticated centrifuges so they could spin that much faster, so that they get that much quicker, you could have a high, high purity enriched uranium for nuclear weapons. And that's with a 10 year period, that means up to 2025. The same thing with enrichment, 15 years, that means up to 20, 2030, 2030. Iran could cease and desist and say, we can enrich up to 90%. This is, this is the point. So I think there's a, there's a cry for, if we can't moderate their geopolitical behavior, at least on the nuclear side of the ledger, because it's a message to all the countries in the region and the world, let's at least edit, moderate, change, amend the JCPOA, amend it accordingly, and to prohibit enrichment. And that's why I cite and I, I, I applaud what Senator Menendez has been doing with his colleagues in the Senate, with Senate Resolution 511. That reads, just a small section of it that reads, establish a regional fuel bank that would assist international efforts to avoid a destabilizing arms race in the Middle East and would promote the peaceful use of nuclear power. This is where we need to be going. 
Because if Iran uh, persists with their programs and they can remain a nuclear, a threshold nuclear weapon state, other countries, whether they be Egypt, whether it be Saudi Arabia, whether it be Turkey, will say, well, maybe we need to also be threshold nuclear weapon states. And that's, that's significant, ladies and gentlemen. And as we see this in, with the tragic war going on in Ukraine, and with, uh, with, uh, with Putin putting on the table his nuclear weapons at a high alert level, we need to be moving in a different direction with nuclear weapons and nuclear technology. So I applaud what the Senator Menendez and his colleagues and the Senate are doing, trying to, to move forward with, but we have, a, we have a task in front of us and we have to prevail with Iran. And I thank you very much for permitting me to share some of my views with you. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Abditrani. You highlighted um, uh, very Im important points. Um, you uh, mentioned that the Iran regime has been in violation of the um, NPT before and after during the, uh, the JCPOA. You mentioned that the, um, uh, certainly the role of Congress, uh, especially what Senator Menendez and in a bipartisan with Senator Lindsey Graham, the resolution they have introduced that they are calling for zero enrichment of the Iran regime. That's our position. We believe that the uh, nuclear program of the Iran regime has always been about nuclear weapons and not energy. And that's why this whole program needs to be uh, dismantled. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for mentioning that. We're, we're now go, going to go to uh, Ambassador uh, Bob Joseph. He was the uh, former uh, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security and Special Envoy for Non-Proliferation. He also served in the National Security Council as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Proliferation Strategy, Counterproliferation, and Homeland Defense. Ambassador Joseph, great to have you with us. Ali Reza, thank you. Please allow me to join with others in extending my best wishes for the Nauru's holiday to you and all of your colleagues in Washington, and of course, to all of your colleagues at Ashraf 3 in Albania. I hope and I trust that this year will bring us closer to our shared goal of a free, democratic, and secular Iran. Today, the world's attention is focused on Putin's war in Ukraine, bringing both heartbreaking images of civilian deaths and inspirational images of Ukrainian resistance fighting the Russian invaders. This may be a transformational event, one that could change the course of history, not only in Europe, but well beyond, as we can no longer escape the reality that evil exists in this world without regard to the idealism of the rules-based international order. And as we think about Ukraine, another potentially transformative event is taking place. And that is the fight for freedom from the religious dictatorship in Iran. But this war is being played out without constant images of death and destruction or the concentrated attention of the media. Instead, the focus is on diplomatic negotiations to bring the United States back into the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear accord. The unintended consequences of such an agreement, which some press reports indicate is imminent, risk the very opposite of what the West rightly seeks in support of Ukraine's heroic struggle. Little is known about the agreement and what has been conceded by the United States in the negotiations. Even Senator Menendez, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, stated recently that he doesn't know what's been agreed. We've received press reports during the nearly year-long Vienna talks that the U.S. had made concession after concession and that the Iranian side, never willing to take yes for an answer, has pocketed each one only to come back and demand more. While, while press reports are not definitive, we know for sure that at least one negotiator on the US side has resigned in protest of the US position being too weak. 
I can assure you that's an extraordinary occurrence. As Judge Marchese's and other has noted, have, have noted, we've seen in recent press reports that the US may have already offered to lift the terrorism designation of, of the Revolutionary Guards, described as the last remaining issue. If Iran agrees not to target Americans and to, and to rein in regional aggression, you might ask yourself, how is this even possible? We know that these are empty promises that would never be fulfilled. As others have pointed out, the IRGC is a terrorist organization. As David said, terrorism is in their DNA. The organization has the blood of hundreds of Americans on its hands dating back decades and continuing until today. It commits terrorism every day throughout the region, directly and through its proxies, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and the list goes on and on. How can this administration believe that Iran would keep such commitments? How can this administration believe that rejoining the JCPOA will bring detente with Iran and a more stable region? Never mind that these dangerous fantasies were proved false in 2015, when the tens of billions or more dollars given to Iran were used to do just the opposite. Yet they still seem to guide the administration's grand policy. Little wonder why our friends and allies in the region are reassessing their security relationship with the United States and looking to Beijing and in some cases even to Moscow for support. Little wonder why their leaders won't pick up the phone when the president calls. So how should we assess the agreement once it is made public. Senator Menendez has suggested three very reasonable criteria. First, it should roll back Iran's nuclear capabilities and close the pathway to a nuclear weapon. Second, it should provide for effective verification. And third, it should constrain Iran's missile force. Yet none of these have any prospect for being met. The Potemkin constraints on the nuclear program even if observed, will begin to expire in 2026. Iran will, without doubt, fail to come clean on its weaponization program, despite longstanding promises. And Iran has rejected all constraints on its missile forces. What we do know, because we've seen the movie before, is that Iran will take the windfall it receives from the lifting of sanctions and use it to further its aggression in the region to fund terrorist activities, to expand its missile and nuclear programs, and to repress the people of Iran who seek their freedom and dignity. Statements that we will negotiate follow-on agreements to deal with these issues simply insult one's intelligence. So why is the administration seeking an agreement at any cost? Is it that the administration is comprised of the same policy team that struck the fatally flawed agreement in 2015 and are acting to preserve their legacy? Possibly. Is it that the administration has learned nothing from Iran's actions following the 2015 agreement? Possibly. Is it that the administration fails to see how the world has changed in the last seven years, including the expansion of Iran's nuclear program making it today a virtual net nuclear weapon state? Possibly. Is it that the president and his team are deeply inflicted with the Trump derangement syndrome and insist on reversing his withdrawal from the JCPOA? Undoubtedly. But most of all, I believe the main reason is the administration's failure to understand one basic point. The Iranian regime will never will never give up its nuclear weapons program. It is a weak regime. It is a desperate regime at war with its own people. It sees as the lesson from Gaddafi in Libya and likely now from Ukraine, that it must have a nuclear weapons capability as a guarantee to deter outside intervention in the civil conflict that is certain to come as the Iranian people rise up in their demand for freedom and dignity. 
It is this basic fear, this, it is this basic fact that should guide US policy, providing hope and assistance to the Iranian opposition, not a lifeline to the mullahs. Thank you for the invitation to join you this morning. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, um, Ambassador Joseph. Uh, you certainly had um, important points to make. Uh, uh, one I like to highlight is that you mentioned that uh, this is a, a weak, a desperate regime at war with its people. And you mentioned the um, need to stand on the side of the people of Iran uh, for change. Appreciate that. Now we're going to uh, go to um, Honorable Paula Dobryansky, uh, former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs for eight years. Um, she is a senior fellow at the um, Harvard University Belfort Center. Uh, she is also the vice chair of uh, Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Uh, during her more than 25 years in national security affairs, she has held many Senate confirmed positions in the U.S. government, including director of European and Soviet affairs at the uh, NSC. Welcome, Ambassador. I appreciate your participation. You're probably the um, only person on this uh, conference who is of Ukrainian descent. Uh, I know you have a, a lot to say about Iran, but it would be great if you can also um, address uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Ambassador, please. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ali Reza. Thank you, and happy Nowruz. Uh, happy Nowruz to you. And also, I'd like to say happy Nowruz to all those Iranian families uh, celebrating uh, this jubilant holiday. Uh, I hope that this new day brings health, happiness, and prosperity to each of you, uh, your families, and your loved ones. And, you know, on this special occasion of Nowruz, I hope for a new day. Uh, that's certainly the term that is used, a new day in Iran that is built on those foundational principles, in fact, of human rights, freedom, and democracy. You know, there's an ancient Persian poet uh, by the name of Asadi Shirazi, who once wrote, quote, thank God the pleasant Nowruz breeze returned and freed us from the cold, unquote. I wanted to share and remind of that quote because however, your beloved ancient country is still held in the cold, captivity of the Ayatollah's brutal regime. And I'd like to first say a few words about the human rights situation in Iran today. The Iranian regime continues severe repression of the Iranian people. Iranians who seek economic rights, they fight corruption, as we know, and have presented uh, and protested the brutal regime, uh, have been persecuted, they've been imprisoned, and sometimes executed as well. Last year, Iranian security forces killed hundreds, hundreds, and they arrested thousands in a series of anti-government protests that took place to really protest against particularly the uh, corruption and also the suppression of rights. Now, according to the United States State Department, the annual human rights report, this is a quote, the government of Iran severely restricted freedom of speech and of the press and use the law to intimidate or prosecute persons who directly criticize the government or raised human rights problems. You know, another area that really stands out as egregious in terms of human rights violations is that of women's rights and dignity. They're also heavily restricted in Iran. Married women cannot get a passport or leave the country without their husband's permission. And a woman considered disobedient or for no reason at all could be beaten and injured. Her children could be taken away from her. The regime has really failed miserably also in addressing the uh, epidemic of, of, and truly epidemic of domestic violence. So human rights has been uh, totally the human rights violations have been systemic to Iran. And let me finally mention in this area, Freedom House also talked about how non-governmental organizations 
that track human rights violations are also very much suppressed by the regime. One, for example, the Center for Human Rights Defenders is closed and some of its members are imprisoned. Now, I'd like to also say a few words about some other very current topics. Today, it has also been reported that the Biden administration is considering the removal of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Guard Corps the IRGC, as a terror organization in return for a public commitment from Iran to pursue a de-escalation de in the region. Now, the possible removal obviously comes at a time where these JCPOA negotiations are ongoing. The IRGC is responsible for countless merciless attacks on American civilians and allied forces throughout the Middle East. Furthermore, they also have been very responsible for the killings of thousands in Syria and Lebanon. So here, what is my message? My message on this is that IRGC should not be delisted from the State Department's Foreign Terrorist Organization designation. I also want to say a word about JCPOA. The administration also seeks to revive the JCPOA. Uh, it is a bad deal. And actually, I think it could be said that it's worse in many respects than the original JCPOA, although the JC, original JCPOA was bad. Uh, it will not prevent Tehran from acquiring nuclear weapons or engaging in terrorism or, for that matter, regional aggression. Finally, I'd like to start with the point that you asked me, Ali Reza, and asked me about, and that's Ukraine being of Ukrainian descent. The global community is witnessing, in fact, Russia's war on Ukraine and the ongoing massacre of Ukrainians. The Iranian regime has absolutely supported the revisionist narrative of Vladimir Putin, as well as supporting the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a scorched earth attack on innocent civilians. And in fact, one of Putin's first phone calls was in fact to the uh, Iranian president after he ordered the invasion. And this comes also right after Iran asserted earlier this year its commitment to boost and strengthen its ties with Russia in a new long-term bilateral cooperation agreement. So as we come together celebrating the new year, let us be reminded of the strength of those freedom-loving peoples in Iran and around the world and that very hope for a new day. Happy Nowruz. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Ambassador um, um, Dobriansky, uh, um, for your great remarks, but reminding everyone about the uh, Saadi Shirazi, the famous uh, poet of Iran that talked about uh, putting an end to the cold and captivity, um, and reminding us of the the, the brutal regime in Iran, and you talked about the human rights, women's and uh, um, rights, and you ended with the strength and the power of the people of Iran and their desire uh, for change uh, in Iran. Really appreciate that. Um, we're now going to um, hear from uh, General Chuck Wald. Uh, General Wald is a former deputy uh, commander of uh, United States uh, European Command. He has an impeccable military career, including uh, commanding the uh, 9th um, Air Force and U.S. Central Command Air Force and Shaw Air Force Base, uh, South Carolina. General Wald, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the Iran regime's threats and the way to deal with it. And thank you for joining us, uh, General. Please. Thank you, Larissa, and, <clears throat> and uh, Happy New Year and Nawaz to the entire NCRI team and uh, everybody associated with this call. I, I have to say that uh, most of the uh, cogent points from a diplomatic standpoint have been covered you know, extremely well by the last three ambassador speakers, and it's impressive. Um, what I'd like to do is just spend a moment, I think, to put into maybe military context the um, significance of a JCPOA agreement in the terms and the structure that we're looking at today and the significance of uh, that agreement allowing Iran to still move uh, toward uh, becoming a nuclear nation. 
I don't think anybody uh, in the world today uh, that has a uh, TV or a cell phone uh, has missed what's happening in the Ukraine and um, the uh, significance of that, not only from the standpoint of uh, Europe, but from the global standpoint. Uh, one of my frustrations has been <clears throat> over the last uh, several years, uh, the probably the biggest, uh, I think, the poorest uh, definition of what we should do as a foreign policy for the United States is when we said we need to pivot toward China. I fully agree China is a threat. We need to focus on that. But when you say the word in English, pivot, it means you turn your back on something. Uh, and in that case, we turned our back on the Middle East to a certain extent. Uh, the Middle East is not going away from the standpoint of importance for a lot of reasons. Uh, and we need to stay focused on that. The issue in the Ukraine that's uh, held the US administration back primarily, I think, has been the threat uh, by Putin that he would use nuclear weapons if uh, forced into that corner. That is a significant issue for any country that has that type of weapon and leverage. My concern is that uh, Iran would uh, move toward the weapon uh, if this agreement is made, uh, that they would have the ability to uh, use the, any nuclear uh, weapon as total leverage in the Middle East. It would uh, uh, significant, uh, significantly inhibit us from uh, using some of our capabilities in the Middle East to support our friends in the Middle East. As was uh, mentioned by uh, the ambassador earlier, uh, the Russians and uh, Chinese are making inroads in the Middle East because uh, of the belief by the leadership in both the UAE and Saudi Arabia primarily is that we're um, uh, departing from the Middle East in a big way. It's lost its stature as an important part of our foreign policy and, and the global, uh, issues that we concern ourselves with in the United States. Uh, you've got uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, who's the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates, uh, is a extremely savvy and um, experienced leader in, in these types of issues. And he's making it public that he's having uh, meetings with uh, Russian and Chinese uh, diplomats and others, uh, government officials to discuss how there could be a collaboration on various issues. That is a ominous issue for the United States. Uh, so I think the number one issue for me is the fact that uh, the, the world would change significantly if Iran had a nuclear weapon, not just from an Israeli standpoint, from the rest of the Middle East. Uh, number two, I totally echo the concerns with the IRGC be, being taken off the terrorist list. There's no way that should be allowed to happen. They, are, uh, they're, they make the Russians look uh, weak in a lot of ways from the standpoint of how, they, um, how their actions are in the Middle East and what they've done. And then lastly, that uh, kind of an unforgotten part of the, the whole issue that I think the Jinza group and Jonathan Rui is on here, my colleague from Jinza, can talk to this at length, but the ballistic missile development and testing by the Iranians is another step that uh, is lost in the discussion many times, but is a significant issue for the United States. So I would say, uh, Elarisa, and, and for everybody on this call, the, the major thing we should be thinking of right now is how, if Iran were to get a nuclear weapon, it would change the dynamic in the Middle East. It would uh, handcuff the United States from the standpoint of our uh, participation there and our negotiations with other countries in the Middle East. It's going to definitely change our stature with our allies. Uh, and the IRGC being taken off the um, terrorist list would be uh, a, a huge mistake and, and actually immoral. So uh, Alarisa and everybody here, uh, happy new year. Um, I'm sure at some point we can have this call from Tehran, but I'm looking forward to that. And in the meantime, Happy New Year to all. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, General, for your comprehensive remarks. And um, I take you on that important wish to have um, uh, this, these events uh, very soon um, in Tehran in a, in a free uh, democratic republic form of government uh, in Iran. And what an impact that would have not just on Iran or the people of Iran or the countries in the region, but the whole globe. Um, again, thanks a lot for, for that. Now, with that, I'm going to go to um, Dr. Stephen Bucci, Visiting Research Fellow for um, Special Operations and Counterterrorism 
at the um, Heritage Foundation. He is also um, he was also a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Uh, Dr. Pucci, please let us know what you think is important and relevant about Iran in light of all the talks in Washington. Please. Okay, thank you very much, Ali Reza, and thank you to the council for having me back again at this important gathering, and happy Nauruz to all. Uh, at the risk of being somewhat repetitive with some of our other esteemed speakers, I'll offer my views, which I think are pretty much in alignment with everyone else. I'll probably speak a little more plainly than some of the others, uh, but the original uh, JCPOA was a huge mistake. It was driven by an irrational desire by the Obama team to realign America's policy foundations in the Middle East, uh, to somehow think that the regime in Tehran, as it exists now and as it did during the Obama administration, that it would be uh, a partner for the United States and somehow improve the way we work was ridiculous. Uh, the idea that that regime would change its terrorist stripes and suddenly be nice was ludicrous and ignorant then, and it still is today. Uh, the monies released from the frozen accounts and, and outright gifted to Iran did nothing but fuel terrorism and the continued development of the other weapon systems that Iran is counting on to bring even more destruction to the region. Uh, the lack of any aspects that would have uh, restrained the IRGC and accepting that fact made the United States look weak, feckless, and frankly, clueless. Uh, then Secretary of State John Kerry's comments of, well, but this isn't about the IRGC, it, it's about their nuclear program. How could anyone sitting in the Secretary of State's office think that these things were not inextricably connected to one another. Uh, the, the more strict policies of the, of the Trump administration were in fact moving Iran to a degree uh, towards compliance. Uh, it was at least looming on the horizon as a possibility. And the, the way we knew that was how stridently the mullahs were squealing under the pressure of those policies. Now, President Biden has abandoned the concept of dealing from strength and has, is basically giving Tehran exactly what it's been praying for. Uh, when you add to that mix the, the complication of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it really goes south. Uh, could America look any more confused and inept in dealing here, we have the Russians negotiating for America to renew the JCPOA. At the same time, we're asking Iran and Russia, two countries that we have sanctioned, to pump more oil for us because of purely domestic concerns. I don't like paying any more for gas than anybody else, but the idea of going to those two countries that way is, is crazy. Uh, Tehran, as has been mentioned, has supported Russia in their illegal invasion of Ukraine from the day it started uh, in, in defiance of the will of the rest of the civilized world. Uh, and at the same time, Russia adds its own demands to the negotiations and says they'll, they won't get the deal signed unless they are given complete free reign for its trade relations with Iran. So no restrictions on Russia at all in this regard. I, to be honest with you, I don't know how you know, poor Don Lemon and the other people on, on the legacy media are, are dealing with this. They're so befuddled and confused that it would be humorous, except except that it's so sad. Uh, the Biden administration now wants to lift the foreign terrorist organization designation for the IRGC. 
look, as a former Army Green Beret, these are the people I used to chase around the world. The IRGC is the most dangerous terror organization in the world. They are the ones who empower the other really important terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, uh, like the Syrian government, like uh, different parties in Lebanon, uh, it, around Iraq. Uh, and why do we want to lift this designation? Not because the IRGC has changed a whit. It's because we just want to sweeten the pot to try and get Tehran to buy on to this deal. They are playing us again like a fine violin. And America, again, looks weak and feckless. Uh, so we're going to flood Tehran with money at the same time repeating the blunder of putting no restrictions on the IRGC activity. So we take off restrictions on Tehran. We again give them literally boatloads of money. All the while, they are unrepentant, undeterred, and blatantly proclaiming that they will continue their terrorist operations and support of all of these other terrorist factions around the world. These actions cannot even be considered a policy. When you lump them together, they are so schizophrenic that, that the internal conflicts of them hardly can stand up. Biden must drop this fool's quest to reform the present regime in Tehran. It will not change. The IRGC is still a foreign terrorist organization and the murderous leaders in power in Tehran will never be a viable negotiating partner for any responsible nation, let alone for the United States. We must stop this foolishness and try to work of trying to work with the mullahs and return to operating from a position of strength and maximum sanctions and do our best to end this horrific regime and work toward true freedom for the Iranian people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bucci. Uh, um, you certainly um, uh, hit the key points regarding the nuclear weapons program of the Iran regime, regarding the terrorism, uh, the IRGC, and that um, the people of Iran uh, want to end the rule of the Ayatollahs and bring democracy and, um, and human rights. You mentioned the, um, the problems with the JCPOA. I, I think that there is a very strong bipartisan voice in the U.S. Congress about that. And um, just uh, last week, uh, Senator Bob Menendez, the powerful chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, he spoke at the, um, the uh, addressing the Iranian Americans. Um, he uh, mentioned that um, it's been, I, and I quote him, it's, he said, it's been um, clear for a year, but has become even more abundantly clear um, uh, over the past uh, few weeks that Iran is simply looking uh, for any excuse to drag out talks while it continues to advance its dangerous um, nuclear uh, program. He had said um, earlier in February that um, this is exactly why I was um, so concerned over the JCPA framework of leaving the vast majority of Iran's nuclear program intact. And he also described the JCPA as deeply flawed. Um, the voice is uh, not just him, and he has a, a, a strong uh, group of uh, Democrats who are backing him, Senator Cardin, Senator uh, uh, Shaheen, and, and, and others, and also on the Republican side, um, the uh, ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Jim Risch. Uh, you have Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Pat Toomey uh, from Pennsylvania, and, and a host of others who actually very recently signed a letter by 42, uh, 49 Republicans expressing the, the very concerns that uh, you raised today. Um, with that, um, let's go to um, uh, Jonathan Rui, who is the uh, Director of Foreign Policy at uh, JINSA. Uh, prior to that, um, he was a senior policy analyst at the 
Bipartisan uh, Policy Center, where he worked on the Middle East and former Soviet Union security issues. He was also previously at the Hudson Institute. I know he's done a lot of work and research on the missile and the drone program of the Iran regime in addition to the uh, uh, nuclear weapons program. Um, uh, Jonathan, great to have you. Um, please go ahead. Thank you, Ali Reza. And uh, first of all, I just want to echo all my fellow panelists in saying Happy Nowruz. I'm very pleased to have the chance to address this audience and to be part of this esteemed panel. Um, we've heard certainly a lot about the nuclear deal. I'll try to cover a, a couple angles I think that haven't yet been uh, tackled head on. And then as, as Ali Reza mentioned, I'll, I'll discuss the, the missile and drone program and, and where this goes from here. Um, the new nuclear deal, which certainly appears imminent, uh, will be sold by its proponents as a straightforward return to the original JCPOA of 2015. But in reality, I think this deal is something rather different and in fact, far worse. Um, rather than the longer, stronger deal pledged by the Biden administration, this new agreement is actually weaker and shorter. Uh, assuming that like with the JCPOA, Iran will again be permitted to keep its advanced centrifuges in country. And because this centrifuge program is much more extensive than it was seven years ago, this means that under the new deal, the regime will be something like six months away from producing enough fissile material for a bomb uh, compared to the stated 12 month breakout timeline under the original JCPOA. Uh, additionally, this breakout time will start shrinking long before the deal officially sunsets. Uh, just four years from now, compared to a decade under the original deal, uh, the Iranian regime is permitted to steadily expand its enrichment capacity using more and more advanced centrifuges. Another way this new deal will be different is in terms of the consequences on the ground in the Middle East. Uh, like in the original deal, the Iranian regime will receive something roughly on the order of uh, $100 billion in various forms of, of sanctions relief, which, as we've heard from other panelists, would be an unmerited lifeline of cash for a weak regime. Uh, just as it did when the original deal came out, uh, the regime can be expected to spend most of this money on fomenting instability abroad, especially around the Middle East, as opposed to spending it at home where the money is desperately needed to reverse and address the regime's incredible mismanagement of Iran's economy, natural resources, and its human capital. What's worse, uh, compared to the 2015 deal, uh, the regime's missile and drone capabilities are much more advanced now, and it can proliferate these capabilities much more effectively around the Middle East than it could in 2015. Uh, my organization closely tracks the regime's missile and drone attacks around the region. And just to give everyone sort of a brief snapshot, I'll just note that in 2015, when the original deal was agreed, Iran and its proxies used roughly 100 total projectiles in attacks around the Middle East. And most of these projectiles were simple, relatively rudimentary, unguided short range rockets. Uh, by comparison, uh, just last year, that number was up to 750 compared to 100 seven years ago. And these were mostly advanced, longer range, and much more precise drones and ballistic missiles. This represents a major upward trend in Iranian capabilities, and it will only get worse with sanctions relief. In fact, uh, that number I quoted of 750, uh, currently the regime is on pace, including with its proxies, uh, to break that record this year. So what this all means is that far from putting Iran in a box, as the Biden administration said last year, the New Deal actually paves the way for this regime to build up a large scale nuclear weapons program in the near future and to further ramp up its already high aggression around the Middle East, and that will begin almost immediately. Uh, but sort of to, to close, I want to highlight, uh, I think, an additional underappreciated aspect of this nuclear deal, which is the profoundly undeserved legitimacy it will grant the Iranian regime. Uh, obviously, the hot topic right now, which we've been discussing, is the lifting of the IRGC sanctions, which I would just reiterate have nothing to do with what's required of the United States to rejoin a nuclear deal. And it would be a completely unmerited unilateral gift to the regime. And it would confirm for Iranian negotiators the wisdom of sticking by their red lines, especially red lines that have nothing to do with the deal and would confirm for them the United States' willingness to cave on any number of Iranian demands regarding its nuclear program or more generally. 
I would just add, um, there's the issue of the non-proliferation treaty or the NPT. Uh, under the treaty, the Iranian people have every right to peaceful nuclear technology for energy and medical purposes, but the regime has consistently violated the NPT through its covert activities on a nuclear weapons program. Uh, many of those activities, the NCRI has helped reveal uh, to the world. These illegal actions initially led to UN Security Council sanctions on the regime, which in turn helped form the basis for US, EU, and other sanctions. However, just three years from now, under the terms of the nuclear deal, these sanctions will eliminate, be eliminated, as will the legal basis for them, even though the regime has done nothing to come clean about its past work on nuclear weapons. So in essence, this deal legitimizes the regime's lies about its so-called peaceful nuclear intentions, and it's declared but unfounded right to enrich uranium. Again, that's a right the Iranian regime claims with no basis um, under, international, uh, under international law or uh, given its long record of, shall we say, violating its safeguards agreements. So uh, to close, I would just summarize the sort of three overarching negative consequences of this deal. The first is it does not prevent a nuclear armed Iranian regime, but rather does the opposite in a uh, shorter period of time than I think a lot of people appreciate. Secondly, through sanctions relief, it will supercharge the regime's increasingly dangerous program of military expansion around the Middle East, which is again, the opposite of putting Iran in a box. And third, it will give the regime's nuclear weapons program undeserved legitimacy, which will in turn have serious consequences for the broader non-proliferation regime more globally. So in each of these ways, this nuclear deal will not encourage the regime in Tehran to become more moderate, as the deal's supporters have long advocated, but it will rather empower, enrich, and entrench this regime. Uh, thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate the chance to speak with you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, um, um, Jonathan. Really, um, really appreciate uh, your uh, remarks, um, a very comprehensive uh, remarks you made. You um, summed it up but that there is no justification for any sanctions relief and any relief actually makes things even worse um, in terms of the terrorism of the Iran regime, in terms of their nuclear weapons program, in terms of the um, uh, threat they're posing to their own people and also uh, in the region. Now I'm going to um, uh, go to a very top expert on the economy. Um, Dr. Siamak Shujai is a professor of uh, economics and finance at William uh, Patterson University. Uh, previously, he served as uh, Dean of School of Business for 20 years at various institutions such as uh, State University of New York, Plattsburgh, Central Connecticut State University, and William Patterson University. He's the editor of books in the areas of oil industry, globalization, and fiscal policy. He has also published uh, peer-reviewed articles about economic sanctions and oil production. Dr. Shujai has resided, resided in the U.S. since 1978. Without the opportunity to visit his uh, birthplace, Iran, he has closely followed the developments there. Professor, very glad to uh, have you with us, and um, please go ahead and share your thoughts. Unmute yourself, Professor. Sorry about that. I, I thought you would uh, do that. But thank you very much for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to be among such a distinguished panel of experts, uh, people who really are knowledgeable about what is happening in Iran, in the global economy and in the, in, in, uh, the Middle East, and who deeply care about uh, uh, not only the interest of the Iran, uh, of America, but also Iranian people. Uh, many often when I talk to people inside Iran, they tell me, CMAC, why don't you go and explain it to the U.S. administration? Tell them what is going on in Iran, what is happening, how miserable our life is, how this regime has destroyed our economy, how they are murdering us, and tell them, please help us do something about it. And after today's discussion and listening to the wisdom of so many wonderful people, I will be reporting to them that you have no worries at all. There are enough thoughtful, thoughtful people and experts in the United States 
who do understand what is going on and what is the uh, what, what, what is the uh, consequences of the actions of the illegal regime in Iran. Uh, David said that terrorism is part of DNA of the Revolutionary Guards. In fact, a quick look at the constitution of uh, the, the clergy regime in Iran proves that and demonstrates that. The mission of the Revolutionary Guards is basically two. Number one, to make sure that the re regime remains in power no matter what. They can use any means and do anything they wish as long as they keep the regime in power. And that means repressing Iranian people, forming secret services, which go and arrest Iranians uh, at wish, torturing them, killing them, and also shooting people on the streets who are just peacefully demonstrating and demanding their democratic rights, economic rights, and human rights. The other mandate of these uh, uh, basically uh, uh, clergy guards, not Iranian guard or even a revolutionary guard is basically to support all activities of the regime to export this revolution to outside of Iran initially to Shiite Muslim countries, in the next stage to all Muslim countries, and finally wishful thinking to export their so-called revolution to the entire world. The revolutionary guards, they do this by not only using terrorism externally, but uh, by supporting terrorist groups all over the region and even in our backyard in Latin America and South America. They have attempted many times to recruit even criminal uh, figures to act uh, on their behalf and commit terrorism. The Revolutionary Guards accomplished their mission by totally controlling the Iranian economy, either directly or indirectly. More than 70% of the Iranian economy is controlled by four major agencies. Three of them are directly under the rule of uh, uh, Khamenei, the Supreme Leader. And the fourth one also under his rule and control is indirectly controlled by the Revolutionary Guards in support of the terrorist activities of the regime abroad. These are like Mustazafon Foundation, Oats Foundation, and the construction uh, of the Order of Khomeini, which was an entity created right after Khomeini took over Iran in order to confiscate any property, any asset under any excuse as they wished. And of course, the Khatam, uh, Khatam uh, uh, Foundation, uh, which is like a foundation, but it is part of the Revolutionary Guards and controlled by them. And it controls basically all the oil, gas, petrochemical, construction, and many other industries in Iran. Every dime, every dollar released to the clergy in Iran, to the Revolutionary Guards, is a dollar which goes directly in the hands of terrorists all over the world. Meantime, Iranian people are miserably suffering from extremely high inflation. The official rate is 40%, but many, many Iranians report to me that when they look at a basket of basic things that they consume, prices keep doubling every few months and they cannot even have access to the basic necessities. Meanwhile, the clergy are enjoying billions of dollars of uh, stolen funds and investing in Venezuela, in Lebanon, and elsewhere on planet Earth. Iranian people complain about unemployment rate among youth being more than 40%. Unemployment rate among women is literally 90%. And then uh, all the funds that have been given to this regime, even when there were no sanctions, even when there was no extreme pressure and uh, during the uh, previous, uh, uh, previous uh, government 
Ahmadinejad's government, more than $800 billion worth of oil revenue was just siphoned out without even a dime of benefit to the Iranian people. People are miserable, people are out there, and the sanctions have had nothing to do with the mismanagement and corruption that exists in Iran, which has caused economic misery among Iranian people. The question is, what should uh, the outside world do about this? The outside world has two choices, in my opinion. Number one, to continue and not to learn any lessons from the past 20 years or the past 42 years, and more or less continue the game of uh, uh, cat and mouse and also the policy of appeasement and let the revolutionary guards and the clergy have access to billions of dollars, you can probably trace some of those dollar bills which were put in a suitcase and delivered to the regime under the, the agreement of 2015 in South America, <laughs> in Lebanon, and many, many other places wherever the terrorists are. Follow that policy and hope that, hope that this regime will change its DNA. The current administration can placate the Iranian regime, continue what has not been effective at all. The role model for regime, this regime when it comes to nuclear weapons and nuclear capabilities is North Korea. And now the Ukraine situation demonstrates to them that in order to fill the conventional military gap, they need nuclear weapons. Like Putin is threatening the world with a nuclear war. They believe that if they acquire nuclear arsenal, they will be in a much stronger position and their conventional military weaknesses will be basically reinforced by the threat of nuclear war. The other choice, and I'm going to conclude in here, uh, the other choice of the free world is to join the Iranian people, to hear them and to assist them, to stand by them and hope that through their direct effort and the real and full support of outsiders, including the United States of America, this regime will be sent to history and a free, democratic, and secular Iran will be basically prevailing in Iran and will build the future of Iranian people. I am a father of three sons who were born in America. And now I have two grandchildren who were born in America. I am really worried about the future of my children and grandchildren, as long as this regime the legal regime is in place in Iran. It won't be long when their missiles would reach potentially where my grandchildren sleep in New York. God bless all of us. And I hope that the United States government, particularly the current administration, will choose the right decision. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Siamak Shajai, um, for sharing uh, your years of experience and expertise, uh, especially on the um, IRGC, on the Iranian economy. You said the economy is totally dominated by the IRGC, that 70% uh, of the economy is controlled by the Supreme Leader and the IRGC, that, that they're not, you, I like the, your description, they call them clergy guards because they're neither Iranian a no revolutionary and you call for standing on the side of the people of Iran. Really appreciate that. And now um, uh, we have received um, so many uh, tape messages from young Iranian Americans who wanted their voices uh, to be heard. I, uh, I pick one of them to uh, show here. This one is from uh, Sina Saidian. He's actually a sophomore from the uh, prestigious University of California in Berkeley. He's born in the US. But, but his parents, both of them academics, were born in Iran. Let's watch Sina. Good morning, distinguished guests. Thank you all for joining us today to celebrate the Iranian New Year. My name is Sina Sayedian, and I am a student at UC Berkeley. While the dawning of spring is meant to be a time of celebration in Iran, 
The new year also provokes a sense of reflection in all of us. As members and friends of the Iranian American community, we can't forget the common cause that we've all gathered here today to support. We also cannot forget the sacrifices and efforts that all of us here have made in our commitment to a free Iran. On behalf of the younger generation of Iranian Americans, I'd like to thank all of you for your enduring policy advocacy for freedom and democracy in Iran. And in the spirit of celebrating Iranian culture and the new year, I'd like to play a short song called Gole Goldun, which roughly translates to blossoming flowers. And to me, the song invokes a sense of hope for a new era blossoming from the youth in Iran. And I hope that that feeling is shared among all of you as well. Each other in person in a future meeting. Thank you, Sina. Great, uh, great message of um, hope from a forward looking young Iranian American who has not seen Iran but is sure fighting to liberate it. Thank you, Sina. We now have the opportunity to hear from um, former Senator from New Jersey, Senator Bob Menendez, who, by the way, joined the Democratic leadership in his very first term in the um, United States Senate. Uh, we had uh, difficulty with the um, internet um, um, where he is. Um, so um, we're going to show his uh, picture, but have um, his voice. I don't know if we are going to have the um, Senator or not. Um, Senator Torricelli, Bob Torricelli. Um, so uh, let's see if we can uh, um, have Senator Torricelli on. Senator, um, please go ahead. Well, first on this, uh, no rules, let me say to every uh, one in the Iranian American community in the diaspora everywhere, and to those who may hear my voice in Iran, the happiest of, 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 of New Year's. I, I hope everyone enjoys the, the holiday. Um, and then when the holiday is over, gets up again, remembering that in this new year, like in every new year, we hope the Iranian people finally find uh, freedom for themselves, their children, and their country. Uh, 
if there is one thing different uh, this year from all the times we've gathered in the past, uh, I am left with an overwhelming sense of optimism but frustration watching the tragedy unfold in the Ukraine. The Russian invasion, the loss of freedom, the disappearances, the tragic loss of life. And it occurs to me that as the world rises to defend the Ukrainian people for 40 years, the Iranian people have been experiencing the same thing, just in slow motion. Their children disappearing, the loss of the most basic freedom, the imposition of an alien ideology, the imposition of leaders that they cannot choose, the loss of any economic opportunities, living in abject poverty and destruction. We've been saying for 40 years why the Iranian people, and many have rallied to our side around the world, but as we now see the international community in almost lockstep putting sanctions on the Russians for the destruction they have brought to the Iranian people, we ask ourselves, how about Iran? Why is it different? And do the people of Iran frankly deserve less simply because they're not in the heart of Europe? Do we not all have the same standards and the same rights? It's a timely message. It's a timely thing to think about as the Biden administration thinks about sanctions on Iran, whether they might be lifted in a new nuclear deal as they're imposed on the Ukraine. The right answer is the administration is right on the Ukraine. No sanction is too tough until the Ukrainian people have their freedom back and their children have a future and they're safe and secure. That's the same policy for Iran. It is the same thing. And so my message for this no ruse would be that the world see us in the same light. And as the administration negotiates with Tehran, the Mullah is insisting that the Revolutionary Guards be lifted from the terrorist list, we resoundingly say no. What has changed? How, how are the Revolutionary Guards any less terrorist today than they were yesterday? or when they were killing American soldiers in Iraq, how are they less of terrorists? Why? Because the possibility of bringing Iranian oil onto the market to further squeeze the Russians? What kind of a stand for freedom would that be in Europe? What kind of solidarity with the freedom of the Ukrainian people if we did it at the sacrifice of the Iranian people and hypocrisy besides? If we can't deal with a terrorist list, honestly, we shouldn't have it at all. The right decision is the same policy and to hold firm. As surely as these sanctions will break the will of the Russians in the Ukraine, they will break the will of the Mullahs. The idea isn't to have one nation free at the expense of the other being enslaved. It is for all nations to be free. On this no ruse to everyone in the Iranian community everywhere, solidarity always. Those of us who may care about Iran but are not Iranian are no less determined. The Iranian people will be free and this nightmare will end. Happy New Year to everyone and thank you. Who uh, certainly provided valuable points regarding the very credibility of the FTO list as well as the parallels you drew between uh, what's happening in Ukraine and what's been going on in Iran for four decades without getting as much uh, attention. Um, and you talked about the determination. Really appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is uh, someone who has been dealing with science and space all his professional career. Dr. Behzad Raoufi is uh, project verification and validation lead engineer and chief validation engineer for space missions. He's been involved with deep space missions and operations over the past two decades. We appreciate your participation, Dr. Raoufi, and we'd love to hear your thoughts about both the Iran regime's nefarious uh, projects that threaten the global security, but also the shining young generation of Iranians whose agenda is exactly the opposite 
of the Ayatollahs in Iran. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Raufi. Good morning and happy Nowruz to all Iranians and every peace-loving person on earth. And thank you for inviting me to the um, online conference for the occasion of Iran New Year, Prospects of Change. It is an honor to be among such distinguished guests. As an Iranian American who spent nearly four decades in space exploration industry in support of NASA and international space missions, and in light of the recent developments related to Iran and the JCPOA, I'd like to make a few comments on Iran's regime's misuse of its resources and how that will significantly expand if concessions are made and sanctions are lifted. Over the last four decades, the regime has used Iran's resources to ever increase its oppressive policies of jailing, torturing, and murdering anyone in Iran who uh, asks for their basic freedoms and human rights. Its state-sponsored support for terrorism, for terrorist organizations abroad, the power and reach of IRGC and its external arm puts force to further instigate proxy wars in the region. Also, the regime's ambition to not only develop a nuclear weapons capability, but also the capability to deliver warheads via their medium range as well as intermediate range ballistic missile delivery systems. Iran and as its main force IRGC ballistic missile capability has been steadily increasing even when JCPOA was in full effect. Iran's claim of a peaceful space and nuclear program is merely a front for its activities aimed to develop a nuclear uh, weapons capability. I'd like to note that Shahab-3 medium range ballistic missile, which has range of a thousand kilometers has been improved in Shahab-3 variant, which now has a range of up to 2000 kilometers or approximately 1250 miles. This means it can reach countries such as Israel, Egypt, Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece. And according to IAEA, it can likely deliver nuclear warheads. Add one, 110 missile or 110 missile has higher maneuverability when intermediate range ballistic missile capability and was tested in November of 2015 and on January 29, 2017. It's worth mentioning the latter was clearly after JCPOA was signed in July of 2015 and went into effect on January 16, 2016. US considers this to be a violation of UN Security Council resolution 2231, which calls upon Iran to not work on ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Iran just recently flexed its military missile capability by attacking Iraq with many ballistic missiles. All this clearly shows the missile program of the regime has no peaceful purpose. It particularly, and it partially operates under the cover of a uh, space program and is an integral part of its nuclear weapons program. This must significantly be curtailed, if not altogether dismantled. Under the current JCPOA, not only is this not addressed, but come 2023, any current restrictions would be removed. As an Iranian American who loves to see a free, democratic, secular, and non-nuclear Iran, the final message I'd like to leave you with is, that despite the false and deceitful show of external strength, the Iranian regime is regime's ex existential problem is internal and related to its defiant population who want positive change in Iran. The main opposition, NCRI and MEK are organized, increasingly strong and gaining momentum among the defiant youth of Iran. In fact, as we speak, the regime has arrested two award-winning students who received gold and silver medals in astrophysics in international Olympiads because they were accused of working with the main Iranian opposition. Tehran is more concerned about Mrs. Maryam Rajavi's 10-point uh, uh, program for the future of Iran and anyone else uh, than anything else. This is precisely why Ibrahim Raisi responsible for murdering over 30,000 political prisoners in Iran in 1988, was installed at the helm as the regime's president. This is not a sign of strength, 
This is the sign of a trembling and collapsing regime. U.S. policymakers should, and in fact, they should pursue to see the fear and this desperation of Iranian regime and realize that this regime has no future despite projecting external power. Thank you for having me in this program again. And let's hope that this year would mark the beginning of the downfall of the regime and to bring about a democratic Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bezal Raoufi. Um, you provided both the insight about the missile program of the Iran regime, uh, how they use the so-called space program as a cover for their advanced uh, ballistic missile program as part of their nuclear weapons program. But you also highlighted the weaknesses of the regime and the hope uh, for change, which is a real, real hope. Uh, thank you so much for that. Our next, uh, next speaker is uh, Ambassador Mitchell Reese, former um, Director of Policy Planning, U.S. Department of State. He was also United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland, the eighth president and CEO of the Colonial Williamsburg, uh, Williamsburg Foundation, and the 27th president of the Washington College. Um, Ambassador Reese, glad to uh, have you with us. Please go ahead. It is always a great pleasure and privilege to speak to you, especially as it coincides with Nowruz, traditionally marking a new day. I want to wish all of the Iranian people a very happy and healthy new year. All of you are gathered in your homes with friends and family to celebrate this time of rebirth and renewal. But we cannot ignore what has been happening inside Iran and elsewhere around the world. Since 2018, there have been eight major uprisings in Iran involving 200 cities and involving hundreds of thousands of Iranian citizens. The protests have continued to this year. Resistance units organized by the main Iranian opposition, the MEK, and consisting of all sectors of Iranian society have been leading the protests and targeting symbols of repression across Iran. They torched and destroyed the statue of Qasem Soleimani the same day it was erected. They publicly burned pictures and posters of the Supreme Leader and Ibrahimi Raisi, who was directly implicated in the mass murder of 30,000 political prisoners in 1988. These protests have been cheered and hailed by the Iranian people. They give hope to all Iranians that the long nightmare of the Ayatollahs is almost over, and that we can see a new Iran based on the principles of freedom, democracy, and equality. The opposition leader, Madame Rajavi, has used these three words to express her hopes and dreams for a brighter future for all Iranian people. The courage and bravery of the resistance in service to these three principles promise brighter days ahead. But the United States also has an important role to play. Other speakers will address the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, and its dangers. For me, the bottom line is that the criminal regime in Tehran can never be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. There also should be no debate over removing the forest foreign terrorist organization label for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. For one thing, the IRGC has given no indication that it has halted its support for terrorism. In fact, the IRGC took responsibility for a dozen missiles being fired into Erbil, Iraq, near the US consulate just a few days ago. Second, delisting the IRGC would send exactly the wrong message to Tehran and only lead to more terrorism in the region and perhaps beyond. And third, Delisting the IRGC would rehabilitate Iran across the region at exactly the wrong time. The Iranian regime has never been less popular in the Middle East. Recent public opinion polls show that nearly two thirds of young Arabs now view Iran as an adversary. That a majority of all Arabs want Iran to withdraw its support 
for its regional proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, and that more than half of Arab Shiites hold an unfavorable view of Iran. And of course, the Iranian regime has alienated its own population through economic mismanagement, corruption, hostility to the United States, adventurism across the region, and brutal repression. It should surprise no one that Tehran is supporting Russia in its invasion of Iran. The good news is that the brave men and women of Ukraine are being cheered and supported by everyone else around the world, including the Iranian resistance. And like the Iranian resistance, they have become living symbols of defiance in the face of tyranny and aggression. The freedom fighters in Ashraf III are symbols of resistance for the Iranian people. For decades, they have been facing the same situation as the Ukrainian people face today. Whether in Ukraine or Iran, the cause is identical. The fight is for freedom, for democracy, and for equality. In both Ukraine and Iran, these brave men and women are showing the world that these principles are worth fighting for and even dying for. These principles of freedom, democracy, and equality are enshrined in Madame Rajavi's platform for Iran, which calls for the universal right to vote, free elections, and a market economy, and advocates gender, religious, and ethnic equality in a foreign policy based on peaceful coexistence with all its neighbors. As we celebrate the start of the new year, we hope to see Madame Rajavi and these principles triumphant in a new Iran that serves all of the Iranian people. Thank you, and best wishes again for a very happy No Ruz. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rees, for your great remarks, very comprehensive one, addressing all the developments inside Iran, um, the situation in Ukraine, but also um, the very bright prospect for change uh, in Iran, emphasizing on the uh, Ten-point plan of uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Raju. Appreciate that. We'd, uh, we'd like to uh, last uh, but not least uh, go to Ambassador Lincoln Bluefield Jr., uh, former Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. He's also a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center. Ambassador Bloomfield, please. Well, thank you very much, Ali Reza. And, uh, my warmest, most heartfelt Nelruz greetings to you and to the NCRI US office, uh, to our friends at NCRI, our friends in Albania at Ashraf 3, uh, the Iranian American community, and to Iranians all over the world, and to your friends who share in uh, the hopes for a new year. Uh, of course, this is a very somber time, and like many of your distinguished guests, um, I've been focused on the current crisis in Europe and keeping an eye on obviously the negotiations uh, in Vienna and what is happening around the Middle East with Iranian aggression. And it seems to me they are related. Uh, this is a, a difficult time uh, for the US government. They're trying to juggle many things. I sympathize with people who want to stop nuclear proliferation and uh, it's, it's a very important task. Uh, but I also recognize that when Iranians supplied sophisticated missiles are hitting oil and gas targets in Saudi Arabia with precision, and they are coming from Iran, um, that this too uh, cannot be overlooked. And the question is what to do about it. It's been frustrating. Um, and and I, I think what I want to say today, and what I want to say in the spirit of Nowruz, is that I think that the, um, the very uh, horrific events in Ukraine with Russia's mass murder of the Ukrainian people um, is a pivotal moment in history that will affect uh, the future of Iran and the future of US-Iran relations. Here's what I mean. Uh, it has mobilized the West. It has reminded Americans who have been debating each other from the left and the right that we all share in very important uh, principles and the need for peace in the world. Uh, the Ukraine crisis could escalate to the nuclear level. Uh, this is, let's hope it does not. But the point is, when this is over, uh, I believe the West will be more re reinforced. They will have come together to stand against aggression, to, to stand against 
uh, what is against wrong, against criminal violations of the Geneva Convention, the laws of war. And this, I think Russia will be weakened for some time. I think China will have to think very hard about the lesson of this event. And I think the same thing is true of the mullahs of Iran, although I don't think they think very much. They simply do what they do and have done for 42 years. Let me share with you a thought experiment. I don't want to shock you, uh, but it'll keep you awake. What would happen if the United States and other countries lifted all sanctions on Tehran, all of them, terrorism, human rights, all sanctions, and then said, uh, here, now you should give up your nuclear program. And I mean, give it up in a verifiable way, but with one condition. If you violate any of these principles of human rights, terrorism, and so many other things, you will be punished. I think the challenge, ironically, for the West would be our intelligence community. Uh, our CIA director, William Burns, in his confirmation hearing, acknowledged very well all of the aggressions that Iran has been doing in the Middle East. So where is the policy? Uh, I've heard people in the White House say, uh, well, none of this would really be happening if uh, President Trump hadn't pulled out of the JCPOA. Well, you know, uh, I testified to keep the JCPOA because we already paid for it. I didn't think it was the greatest deal. But be that as it may, uh, before President Trump withdrew from the JCPOA, Iran was planning a mass casualty attack in Albania. Iran was planning to kill me and many of you in Paris. And that was before, that was while the JCPOA was being fully uh, abided by, according to the CIA director, Mike Pompeo. So what this tells us is that the regime has been, uh, has been proceeding with the revolution, what they call the revolution, without unceasingly. They've been committing terrorist acts around the world. They murdered Nisman in, in, in Argentina, who, had, who was about to brief uh, his legislature on on who set off the major bombings in the 1990s. Uh, you know, they've had MOIS Section 312 teams uh, chasing down uh, Mujahideen Ekalk members all over the world, surveilling them, threatening them, blackmailing their families. We don't hear about any of this unless, uh, unless they end up in court, as they did in Antwerp and now in, in Sweden and in Spain. Uh, we need to hear a lot more about the Revolutionary Guards, the Quds Force, the Ministry of Intelligence operatives. I mean, think of it. Uh, foreign, the former foreign minister, Zarif, who was so well received by the West, so graciously received, this, his ministry allowed a, a mass casualty bomb to be placed on a commercial airline from Tehran to Vienna in the diplomatic pouch. We never heard any repercussions. So what I'm saying is this. Iran continues to violate international norms. The crisis in Ukraine reminds us all that international norms are, are what we must live by in a peaceful world. So when this is over, mark my words, it's time to have a major conversation about the return of democratic countries, the freestanding world, and groups like the NCRI that support Madame Rajavi's 10-point plan, which is perfectly consistent with all of our values. And to stand for these things, not just because it makes us feel good, but because we need to push back against the deep danger of authoritarians, authoritarians from Moscow to Beijing to Tehran and elsewhere. This is my hope for the new year. I applaud my colleagues for their uh, thoughts in the seminar, and I wish all of you the very best and hope to be with you in this new year. Thank you.